Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Light Humour In the Jag Whiffing Service by David R. Bunch What's He Doing in There? by Fritz Leiber The Scandalised Martians by Arnold Marmer the Short Snorter by Charles Einstein People Soup by Alan Arkin In the Jag Whiffing Service by David R. Bunch Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction February 1959 Narrated by Tom Trussell I had always said there was an easier way, and I think, when we invade, I'll be proved right. But you know how things get started, and how powerful tradition can be, and how old-line thinking can keep people, even a whole planet, in a rut. The big cargo sources were getting bigger and bigger each year, what with the growing popularity of the jag whiff places, and the jag whiff places themselves were growing in number, with more and more people going on the jag because, well, partly because of troubles in the sky, like strange balls whirling around and unexplainable objects going beep and woof and woof woof. We of the saucers had slipped past these first baby objects okay and knew they were just little old harmless ping-pongs that chattered a little now and then like a greeting going past but tell the people that. They'd throw a big glass on one of the whirlers and see spikes sticking out, and maybe a big pair of eyes inside, and a nose, and a long red tongue hanging down. The earth it's, they'd scream like they'd just fallen into one of the hot canals, and they'd race off to a jag whiff, a jag like Judgment Day of Sins itself was after them. And the funny part of it is, I guess the people were right being scared like that, the way things turned out. But is it any wonder we were having to increase the size of the saucers to space all, all that jag whiff up through the rattle balls? And a big reason making me think it could have been done more efficiently, we were having to take so much junk stuff, extra accessories I guess you'd call it, to get the jag whiff. Our earth -it contacts were always giving us the old breeze about cost of labour, cost of materials, improvement in design, and next year's inventories. Apparently the dealers didn't understand that all what the play was with us, because they'd give us so much blab blab that didn't apply, all about futuristic design and about how one jag with a machine had it all over another jag with a machine, which to us didn't mean a thing. And we didn't talk because we'd heard already how some Earthits feared the saucers, and how some Earthits said they didn't exist at all, and how some other Earthits were on the fence saying maybe they did, maybe they didn't, so what? And how there were, was wide fear and great unrest among the Earthits in general. And when it's like that, and you're a possible source of the wide fear and unrest, a whole planet full of people can easily decide they don't want any part of contributing to your pleasure. And that's what the jag whiff was to us, actually. Pleasure. Back home when our troubles had us down, or maybe we just felt like raising a little dust, we'd go to a jag whiff place. We'd plunk down our pay pictures, and the whiff tender would wheel out one of those black rings which they have to keep under special pressures in our climate. Then he'd screw on the tube with the face piece, and we'd take our whiff and something out of the black ring, just seemed like a real thick chest filler to me, would spread all through to the farthest reaches of our breath bags and go into our blood, and suddenly all five of our eye sticks would start whirling and focusing and zeroing in for dames, and our arms and legs would start a kick and a slap dance, enough to shake the planet down. And when our face spines and head tubes would go into that special sharp buzz of contentment, we'd know we were on our jag, full and warm and happy with as much pleasure as any Martian is ever supposed to know. 
but we never revealed the play to our earthit contacts, just slipped in at night in our noiseless sources with all lights dimmed, cleared our cargo tubes of the tons of pay picture we'd brought, green copy of the earthit's currency, and took on as many of the gleaming jagwiffer machines as our cargo tubes would hold. But it is ten years now since a jagwiffer captain had steered his saucer through the warning balls. It got so the satellites would drum on the saucer from a long way out. Deafening. Dreadful. We saw what was coming, and we tried to beat it. We saucered around the clock for a while, trying to stockpile enough jagwiff to last us. But of course, we couldn't. We were about out of it now, and our land is strewn with the glittery shells that were once attached to the black tubes of the jagwiff. And it could have all been done so different, I'm sure it could. That stuff wasn't just in the tubes of the jagwiffer machines down there, I'm convinced of that. That stuff may have been all around us down there, I believe it was. But our government would insist we get into these suits about so far out, you see, about the time we'd start contacting the rattleballs. And they threatened us with removal of the contacts if we broke the rules about the suits. In addition to that, they said we'd die anyway. So see how life can be, grim and fuzzy and unsafe most of the time. And to make things even more uncertain, just because they couldn't duplicate the product we were hauling, our scientists got uppity and ignored the whole problem. Except to run off to the jag with places, of course, to ease their frustrations, which they did plenty often when they thought they wouldn't be seen. And when we invade down through there, which we plan to do soon now, with our special equipment to catch and explode the whirly balls, I think we're going to find out plenty, among other things. I think we're going to find out that the stuff we cargoed up here at such great cost, that was so inefficiently packaged, is all around us down there. I think when we take over down there, with the right filtering equipment, Jag whiffing may become as common and economical as breathing. And another thing, I think we're going to find out we were taken for quite a ride by the Earthits with a silly way of packaging Jag whiff. Imagine having to buy all that chrome and steel, guaranteed to go over 100 miles per hour, just to get four little black rings of whiff. And for all the Earthits talked about it, the rings with the white sidewalls didn't whiff one bit better than the others. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. What's He Doing in There? by Fritz Lieber Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, December 1957 Narrated by Tom Trissel The professor was congratulating Earth's first visitor from another planet on his wisdom in getting in touch with a cultural anthropologist before contacting any other scientists or governments, God forbid, and in learning English from radio and TV before landing from his orbit-parked rocket, when the Martian stood up and said hesitantly, "'Excuse me, please,' But where is it? That baffled the professor, and the Martian seemed to grow anxious. At least his long mouth curved upward, and he had earlier explained that it curling downward was his smile. And he repeated, Please, where is it? He was surprisingly humanoid in most respects, but his complexion was textured so like the rich dark armchair he'd just been occupying that the professor's pinstriped grey suit which he had eagerly consented to wear, seemed an arbitrary interruption between him and the chair, a sort of Mother Hubbard dress on a phantom conjured from its leather. The professor's wife, always a perceptive hostess, came to her husband's rescue by saying with equal rapidity, Top of the stairs, end of the hall, last door. The Martian's mouth curled happily downward, and he said, Thank you very much, and was off. Comprehension burst on the professor. He caught up with his guest at the foot of the stairs. "'Here, I'll show you the way,' he said. "'No, I can find it myself, thank you,' the Martian assured him. 
Something rather final in the Martian's tone made the professors desist, and after watching his visitor sway up the stairs with an almost hypnotic softly jogging movement, he rejoined his wife in the study, saying wonderingly, "'Who'd have thought it, by George, function taboos as strict as our own?' "'I'm glad some of your professional visitors maintain them, his wife said darkly. "'But this one's from Mars, darling, and to find out he's, well, similar in an aspect of his life is as thrilling as a discovery that water is burnt hydrogen. When I think of the day not far distant when I'll put his entries in the cross-cultural index, he was still rhapsodizing when the professor's little son raced in. "'Pop, the Martian's gone to the bathroom!' "'Hush, dear, manners!' "'Now it's perfectly natural, darling, that the boys should notice and be excited. "'Yes, son, the Martian's not so very different from us.' "'Oh, certainly,' the professor's wife said with a trace of bitterness. "'I don't imagine his turquoise complexion will cause any comment at all "'when you bring him to a faculty reception. "'They'll just figure he's had a hard night, "'and that he's got that baby elephant nose sniffing around for assistant professorships.' "'Really, darling!' He probably thinks of our noses as disagreeably amputated and paralysed. Well, anyway, Pop, he's in the bathroom. I followed him when he squiggled upstairs. Now, son, you shouldn't have done that. He's on a strange planet, and it might make him nervous if he thought he was being spied on. We must show him every courtesy. By George, I can't wait to discuss these things with Ackerley Ramsbottom. When I think of how much more this encounter has to give the anthropologist than even the physicist or astronomer, he was still going strong on his second rhapsody when he was interrupted by another high-speed entrance. It was the professor's cultish daughter. Mum, Pop, the Martians! Hush, dear, we know. The professor's cultish daughter regained her adolescent poise, which was considerable. Well, he's still in there, she said. I just tried the door and it was locked. I'm glad it was, the professor said, while his wife added, Yes, you can't be sure what, and caught herself. Really, dear, that was very bad manners. I thought he'd come downstairs long ago, her daughter explained. He's been in there an awfully long time. It must have been a half an hour ago that I saw him gyre and jimble upstairs in that real gone way he has, with nosy hair following him. The professor's cultish daughter was currently soaking up both Jive and Alice. When the professor checked his wristwatch, his expression grew troubled. By George, he is taking his time. Though, of course, we don't know how much time Martians... I wonder. I listened for a while, Pop, his son volunteered. He was running the water a lot. Running the water, eh? We know Mars is a water-starved planet. I suppose that in the presence of unlimited water he might be seized by a kind of madness, and... But he seemed so well adjusted. Then his wife spoke, voicing all their thoughts. Her outlook on life gave her a naturally sepulchral voice. What's he doing in there? Twenty minutes, and at least as many fantastic suggestions later... The professor glanced again at his watch and nerved himself for action. Motioning his family aside, he mounted the stairs and tiptoed down the hall. He paused only once to shake his head and mutter under his breath, By George, I wish I had Fenchurch or von Gottschalk here. They're a shade better than I am on intercultural contracts, especially taboo breakings and affronts. His family followed him at a short distance. The professor stopped in front of the bathroom door. Everything was quiet as death. He listened for a minute and then rapped measuredly, steadying his hand by clutching its wrist with the other. There was a faint splashing, but no other sound. Another minute passed. The professor rapped again. Now there was no response at all. He very gingerly tried the knob, the door was still locked. When they had retreated to the stairs, it was the professor's wife who once more voiced their thoughts. This time her voice carried overtones of supernatural horror. "'What's he doing in there?' "'He may be dead or dying,' the professor's cultish daughter suggested briskly. 
Maybe we ought to call the fire department, like they did for old Mrs. Frisby. The professor winced. I'm afraid you haven't visualized the complications, dear, he said gently. No one but ourselves knows that the Martian is on Earth, or has even the slightest inkling that interplanetary travel has been achieved. Whatever we do, it will have to be on our own. But to break in on a creature engaged in... Well, we don't know what primal private activity is against all anthropological practice. Still. Dying is a primal activity, his daughter said crisply. So's ritual bathing before a mass murder, his wife added. Please. Still, as I was about to say, we do have the moral duty to succour him, if, as you all too reasonably suggest, he has been incapacitated by a germ or virus or, more likely, by some simple environmental factor such as Earth's greater gravity. "'Tell you what, Pop, I can look in the bathroom window and see what he's doing. All I have to do is crawl out my bedroom window and along the gutter a little ways. It's safe as houses.' The professor's question beginning with, "'Son, how do you know?' died unuttered and he refused to notice the words his daughter was voicing silently at her brother. He glanced at his wife's sardonically composed face, thought once more of the fire department, and of other and larger and even more jealous, or would it be sceptical, government agencies, and clutched at the straw offered him. Ten minutes later he was quite unnecessarily assisting his son back through the bedroom window. "'Gee, Pop, I couldn't see a sign of him. "'That's why it took so long. "'Hey, Pop, don't look so scared. "'He's in there, sure enough. "'It's just that the bathtub's under the window "'and you have to get real close up to see into it.' "'The Martian's taking a bath?' "'Yep. "'Got it full up and just the end of his little old schnozzle sticking out. "'Your suit, Pop, was hanging on the door.' "'The one word the professor's wife spoke was like a death knell. "'Drowned!' "'No, Ma, I don't think so. His schnozzle was opening and closing regular-like. "'Maybe he's a shape-changer,' the professor's cultish daughter said in a burst of evil fantasy. "'Maybe he softens in water and thins out after a while until he's like an eel, and then he'll go exploring through the sewer pipes. Wouldn't it be funny if he went under the street and knocked on the stopper from underneath and crawled into the bathtub with President Rexford, or Mrs. President Rexford, or maybe right into the middle of one of Janey Rexford's oh-I'm-so-sexy bubble baths? Please, the professor put his hand to his eyebrows and kept it there, cuddling the elbow in his other hand. Well, have you thought of something? the professor's wife asked him after a bit. What are we going to do? The professor dropped his hand and blinked his eyes hard and took a deep breath. Telegraph Fenchurch in Ackerley Ramsbottom and then break in, he said in a resigned voice, into which, nevertheless, a note of hope seemed also to have come. First, however, I am going to wait until morning. And he sat down, cross-legged in the hall, a few yards from the bathroom door, and folded his arms. So the long vigil commenced. The professor's family shared it, and he offered no objection. Other and sterner men, he told himself, might claim to be able successfully to order their children to go to bed when there was a Martian locked in the bathroom, but he would like to see them faced with the situation. Finally dawn began to seep from the bedrooms. When the bulb in the hall had grown quite dim, the professor unfolded his arms. Just then there was a loud splashing in the bathroom. The professor's family looked toward the door. The splashing stopped, and they heard the Martian moving around. Then the door opened, and the Martian appeared in the professor's grey pinstripe suit. His mouth curled sharply downward in a broad alien smile as he saw the professor. "'Good morning,' the Martian said happily. "'I have never slept better in my life.' even in my own little wet bed back on Mars. He looked around more closely, and his mouth straightened. "'But where did you all sleep?' he asked. "'Don't tell me you stayed dry all night. You didn't give up your only bed to me.' His mouth curled upward in misery. 
"'Oh, dear,' he said, "'I'm afraid I've made a mistake somehow, "'yet I don't understand how. "'Before I studied you, "'I didn't know what your sleeping habits would be, "'but that question was answered for me. "'In fact, it looked so reassuringly homelike "'when I saw those brief TV scenes "'of your females ready for sleep in their little tubs. "'Of course, on Mars, "'only the fortunate can always be sure of sleeping wet.' but here, with your abundance of water, I thought there would be wet beds for all. He paused. It's true I had some doubts last night, wondering if I'd used the right words and all, but then when you rapped good night to me, I splashed the sentiment back at you and went to sleep in a wink. But I'm afraid that somewhere I've blundered and— No, no, dear chap, the professor managed to say. He had been waving his hand in a gentle circle for some time in token that he wanted to interrupt. "'Everything's quite all right. It's true we stayed up all night, but please consider that as a watch, an honour guard by George, which we kept to indicate our esteem.'" The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Scandalized Martians by Arnold Marmer Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, June 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell David Fry wanted to make an epic movie in the realistic school. The trouble was, his ideas wouldn't pass the censors, here or any place else. David Fry was a realist, and also slightly crazy. Maybe that helped in this buggy business, but David Fry overdid it. "'I want her nude!' he screamed. "'Naked!' "'Impossible!' I informed him as calmly as I could. "'Naked!' he bellowed. "'The Breen office won't allow it, and you know it. "'I defy them, those radicals! "'It'll be my most realistic picture, a milestone in filmmaking. "'It won't get the seal of approval.' So what? I don't need it. Every state will ban it. Nevada won't ban it. Besides, you couldn't get Harriet Desmond to strut around in the raw. Oh, no? No. Her option comes up in three months. So what? You're a director. You have nothing to do with it. That's Dwight Howard's department. Look, David, I'll have her in a slip or a bathing suit. Ronnie, he said, shaking his head, I like you. You're a writer, but I like you anyway. I feel that the audience will get the proper impact only if she's naked. It'll be an impact, all right. You write the script the way I tell you. I don't want to argue any more. I like you, Ronnie. If you want a sexy script, I'll make it sexy without being lewd. Sexy? Don't be vulgar. I want a down-to-earth picture like the French and Italians make. I want to surpass them with my realism. David, what good would it do if I did write the scenario your way? The scene would never be shot. Enough! he screamed. He clutched his chest. I feel an attack coming on. Leave me! Get out! Dwight Howard was chief production man at Silver Studios. He listened gravely as I spilled my heart out to him. He's a great director, Dwight Howard said. He was a large man with tiny ears, liquid blue eyes, and the cigars he smoked cost a buck a stogie. Sure, I said. A great, goofy director. He's nuts, just like all directors. He grinned at me. Directors believe all writers are crazy, and writers believe all directors are crazy. You want me to write the script his way? You want that scene shot with Harriet Desmond nude? No, no, of course not. The whole idea is too ridiculous for words he sighed. I'll have a talk with him. David Fry resigned the following day. Tortured and abused actors and actresses celebrated for three days and three nights. Dwight Howard didn't have to accept the resignation as Fry was bound to Silver Studios by an ironclad contract, but a director's work gets sloppy if his heart isn't in it. So out went David Fry, the realist. Nobody in Hollywood heard from Fry in seven months, and nobody seemed to care. One night, as I came home from a party, I was greeted by the screaming of the telephone. I held the receiver to my ear. "'Maternity hospital,' I said. "'Ronnie!' it was David Fry. 
Oh, hello. How's everything? Fine. Great. I got to see you. Well, I'll hop right over. He hung up and I sighed. I built myself a solid drink and got comfortable. He showed up twenty minutes later. He was thinner, more nervous than before. He flopped on a divan. You wouldn't believe it, he said. Believe what? I want to do a picture, a science picture, about a trip to Mars. It's been done, and more than once. With real Martians? I blinked. I'll get you a drink. No, I want a clear head. Hear me out. I've met them. Who? Martians. A whole gang of them. Real, honest to goodness Martians. It's fantastic, but it's true. They landed in the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> that figures. I got my home there. They asked for directions to Hollywood. You know what? They came to revolutionize the industry. Maybe they're commies. You should see their equipment. Fantastic. I talked them into staying over at my place. They dismantled their ship and have it stored away. I want you to do the screenplay. It'll be great. They, er, uh, weren't detected flying over? They use an anti-radar beam. Oh, they can speak every language under the sun. Look, David, I'm tired and I want to go to bed, so be nice and go sober up. You don't believe me? No. In plain language, no. He extracted a square-shaped box from a pocket. See this gadget? I can make myself disappear. Do that. And he did. Yo! I screamed. He reappeared. I staggered to the liquor cabinet and made myself a double-triple whiskey and soda. Well? There was a look of triumph on his face. They give you that? A present. I've got nothing doing for a week. I'll be there tomorrow morning. No, tonight you're liable to blab about it. Don't you trust me? <laughs> no, I know you went to see Dwight Howard about me. Then why do you want me to write the story? I feel you owe me that. You're honest in some ways. Well? Right, I'll pack a grip if I'm staying over. Do that. I've got my car downstairs. David Fry's home was a Spanish-style ranch which consisted of a herd of cattle and horses. The Martians looked like us, except they had no necks and no finger or toenails. Their leader was a giant of a Martian with the name Duma. There were slacks and sports jackets which Fry had bought for them. They seemed pleasant enough. I got some sleep and woke that afternoon. Duma, Fry and myself sat in the front room and talked over the story we were to do. We can't trust anyone, Fry said, so you and I will play the earthlings in it. We'll land on Mars and discover life on the planet. Duma and his crew will play the Martians, real typecasting. What about sets? I asked. Plenty of background on Mars, Duma said. What? I exploded. Sure, Fry said. We'll go to Mars and shoot most of the picture there. Has anyone ever done that before? Sure, Duma said. I meant anyone on Earth, Fry said. I don't like it, I said. We'll bring you back, Duma said. I still don't like it. And we'll do that nude scene, Fry said. We'll have a couple of Martian girls taking a bath nude. Oh no, Duma said. That's out. But why? Fry wanted to know. The Martian censors, they won't go for it. I grinned. There too. But I want to film life in the raw, Fry said. Duma shook his head. Out of the question. We'll do it my way, Fry snarled, or we won't do it at all. Duma stood up. Well, if that's the way you feel about. Now wait a minute, I said. Hold on. David, we've got a great thing here. Don't mess it up. I'm the director, Fry screamed. Nobody's going to tell me my business. Is everybody in Hollywood like him? Duma asked me. Some of them are worse. I realize we have made a grave mistake. I made the mistake of taking you into my home, Fry shouted. I treated you like human beings, and this is the thanks I get. I won't hear another word, Duma turned and marched out. Now see what you've done. I was as mad as a wet hen. 
"'What have I done? All I wanted to do was make a great picture.' "'You insulted him. Why, he's liable to go back to Mars and talk them into invading us.' "'That idiot! What does he know about making pictures?' Activity brought me to the window. I looked out and saw the Martians putting their ship together. Fry came up behind me. The ship blasted off and the Martians went back home. They were hammy actors anyway, Fry rationalised. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. The Short Snorter by Charles Einstein Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, August 1958 Narrated by Tom Trussell Three paths led through the woods away from the resort hotel, and of the three, two were clearly marked, one with a sign that said it led to the lake, the other pointing to all the golf links. The third pathway was unmarked, and this was the one that inevitably the lovers and the honeymooners took, the path that Alice and Fred Daniels followed today. The sun was unusually warm for this time of year, but only a few yards along the pathway Fred and Alice were swallowed up by the great and near great trees of the forest. The sunlight was except for an occasional patch of light here and there, warded away by the foliage above. The forest was very quiet. The pathway bridged a silent brook, and then, perhaps a third of a mile into the woods, turned abruptly to the left, and the woods became even more dense, the pathway narrow. Through the trees to the right at this point was a clearing, an unusual grassy circle perhaps sixty yards in diameter. It was not the clearing itself, however, but instead the glint of colour in the sunlight that caused Fred and Alice to stop and look. Alice said, Fred, what is that? Don't know, he said. Something red. Let's look. The two of them turned off the path and made their way through a dismal barrage of thicket, to the clearing that lay beyond. When they got there, they saw the circular object. Vehicle might be a better word. It was possibly fifteen yards in diameter. It seemed to be made of three rings, smaller ones bottom and top, and the larger one ribbing the centre, and to be constructed of some kind of plastic. Between the central and upper rings was set a series of small windows, the entire thing was painted a gaudy red. "'What do you think it is?' Fred said. "'A flying saucer,' Alice said promptly. She laughed a little, but clutched at her husband's arm. "'Isn't it?' "'I don't know. But what else could it be?' "'I don't know,' Fred said again. "'Let's look inside.' "'Fred,' Alice said, "'you'd better not—' "'Don't be silly,' he said and walked resolutely up to the object and, standing on tiptoe, peered through one of the windows. "'What is it?' Alice called from the edge of the clearing. "'What do you see?' "'It's empty,' he called back. "'What's inside?' Fred shook his head. "'You won't believe it.' "'What?' "'It's got a steering wheel,' he called out hollowly, "'and some dials.' "'My goodness,' Alice said. Is it a real one? How do I know? he said and rejoined her, casting a series of glances uncertainly over his shoulder at the bright red saucer behind him. What do you suppose we ought to do? Tell somebody, Alice said. I suppose. Who do we tell? I don't know. There must be somebody. They looked almost guiltily at each other. Nobody will believe us, Fred said. Why not? Alice said. It's here, isn't it? Fred stopped and thought. Who knows how long it'll stay? They looked at each other again. Then Alice said slowly, If we went back and got the camera... Swiftly, they made their way back toward the hotel through the quiet forest. When they got there, 
they found Mr. Mason, the manager of the hotel, adjusting the badminton net in front of the main porch. Mr. Mason loosed a ready smile. "'How's everything?' he said. "'Find enough to do?' "'Yes, thank you,' Fred said to him. "'We were just walking through the woods. We came back for a camera. Then we're off again.' Mr. Mason nodded. "'Find the saucer?' Fred looked at him. "'You mean the flying saucer?' The manager nodded again. "'I see you did find it. Good. Take a picture of it by all means. I've already taken a whole batch myself.' "'You have?' Fred said, frowning. "'What's it all about?' "'It's a flying saucer,' Mr. Mason said. "'From Venus. Mr. Steriot, who piloted it, is a guest here. I can introduce you to him if you like. He speaks excellent English.' Fred Daniel said, "'Wait a minute. You—' "'Oh, there's no point in it,' Mr. Mason said in a weary tone of voice. "'No point in it at all. I took pictures.' I tried to get the army up here. I wrote letters. He shrugged expressively. It's a cynical age we live in, I guess. No, everybody's very polite, but they make it clear they think it's just a gimmick I worked up to get the hotel publicity. He nodded seriously. The whole pro trouble's with Mr. Steriot. If he had a light bulb for a head, or seven legs, or talked funny, why, it'd be a different thing entirely. But he looks and acts just like you or I. Here I've got a legitimate flying saucer sitting on my property, and you might as well try to tell them it's a, well, a flying saucer, for all they believe me. Now you two have seen it with your own eyes, and you don't believe it either. Fred swallowed and looked at Alice for a moment. Then he said, What did you say his name was? Mr. Steriot, Mr. Mason said. Actually, he's just as happy nobody believes he's from Venus. If they believed it, They'd probably lock him up in jail somewhere, or impound his saucer. As it is, he says this is the first vacation he's had in years. Mr. Mason looked unhappily about him. He's probably in the lounge now. Want to meet him? Fred said dazedly, I— Ah, come on, Mr. Mason said. He won't bite you. He led the way up the steps of the porch, and into the lounge, and over to where a small, moustachioed man— wearing eyeglasses and appearing to be in his late forties, was working a crossword puzzle in the morning paper. "'Mr. Steriot,' Mr. Mason said, "'I should like you to meet Mr. and Mrs. Daniels, also guests here. They've just seen your saucer.' "'Charmed,' Mr. Steriot said, and got to his feet. He shook hands with Fred Daniels. "'Are you here for a long stay, Mr. Daniels?' "'I'm not sure,' Fred said a little unhappily. Mr. Mason told us you were from Venus. I told them about you, Mr. Steriot, Mr. Mason said. Naturally, they don't believe it any more than anybody else. No reason why they should, Mr. Steriot said amicably. No reason in the world, if I may coin a phrase, Dr. Phelps at the Institute didn't believe it either. Mr. Mason said, Mr. Steriot here has a long interview with Dr. Phelps of the Geophysical Institute at Princeton when he first arrived here on Earth with us. Oh, Fred said. He gazed uncomfortably at Mr. Steriot. We didn't mean to interrupt you. I was only doing the crossword puzzle, Mr. Steriot said. Do you know a two-letter word for sun god? Alice said. Is this your first trip here? You mean here to the hotel, Mr. Steriot said, or to Earth? Earth, Fred said dismally. My second, Mr. Steriot said. First trip I round up near Leningrad. Terrible time. I thought they'd talk English, but they don't, and they thought I was an American, and two other officials got into the saucer with me, and the only way I could save myself was to take off with them. They're on Venus now. This accounts, Mr. Mason broke in, for the way those two high Russian officials suddenly disappeared from sight three years ago. You remember? Everybody thought they'd been liquidated. Fred Daniels looked around the room. A hollow, frightening feeling had come upon him. There were hundreds of questions he could have asked, and yet he wanted nothing so much as to be away from there. His wife Alice, though, was constrained to learn more about Mr. Steriot. She said, "'Mr. Steriot, may I ask you something?' "'By all means,' Mr. Steriot said, and blinked owlishly at her. "'Do you, 
Alice said to him. Carry any money? It was, Fred Daniels realised, a marvellous question. If there were sham here, this would be the quickest way to. Why, of course, Mr. Steriot said and reached for his wallet. Let's see. Health insurers, sources, driving licence. Here, my dear, a five Gino bill. He extracted a yellow banknote and handed it to Alice. The banknote, slightly larger than an American dollar bill, was remarkably similar in other particulars. It had upon it a picture of a flying saucer, the figure five, and it spelled out, Five Genos. Let me sign it for you, Mr. Steriot said, taking out a pen. You can have it for a souvenir. Like the short snorters in the war, Mr. Mason, the hotel manager, said. You remember them, Mr. Daniels? Where people got famous signatures on five and ten and twenty dollar bills and exchanged them and what not, and they called them short snorters. I remember, Fred Daniels said, something like that. Five Genos on Venus, Mr. Steriot said, signing his name with a flourish, is worth about twenty dollars here on Earth. No official rate of exchange, of course, but from what I've seen, that's about what I'd judge. Here you go. He handed the bill over. Well, wait then, Fred Daniel said. I ought to sign one of our bills for you. Ah, no need for that, Mr. Steriot said. No doubt you need twenty dollars worse than I need five Genos. Don't be ridiculous, Fred said, a little stiffly, and, by now committed, he went into his wallet and came out with a twenty-dollar bill. He signed his name to it, using Mr. Steriot's fountain pen. Wonderful, Mr. Steriot said. How nice to have met you both. I feel very badly about this, Mr. Mason, the hotel manager, said to Fred and Alice. The three of them were on the porch outside. This short snorter business always seems to happen whenever I introduce Mr. Steriot to anyone. Dr. Phelps at the Institute gave him fifty dollars. Can you imagine that? It's interesting in its way, Fred said. It just occurred to me, Mr. Steriot can spend Earth money here, but we can't spend Venus money. That's true, Mr. Mason said. On the other hand, Mr. Steriot has never once, to my knowledge, been the one to bring up the subject. I think it's quite painful to him, really. But the same thing inevitably occurs to everybody he meets. You know, let's see the colour of a money. I guess people are pretty much the same everywhere, that is, everywhere on earth. They judge everything in terms of money, including whether you've even been born on earth. Let's see your money, they say to Mr. Steriot, and out he comes with one of those damned five Gino bills, and we're off. You know... Alice Daniel said thoughtfully. In a way, it's a lesson. Isn't it, Fred? I mean, everybody is money-conscious. Maybe too much so. I'm not sorry it cost us twenty dollars to meet Mrs. Steriot. You may be right, Fred said to her. You may be right. Who knows, some day this five Gino bill may be very valuable. There you go again, Alice cut in, always putting it in terms of money. But you're the one, Fred said, who thought to ask him about it in the first place. Don't quarrel, Mr. Mason, the hotel manager said to them. After all, for you it's just a vacation. For me, I've got this man sitting in my lounge, day in and day out, doing crossword puzzles and trading short snorters with my guests. Nobody really believes he's from Venus. Nobody important, anyway. It's a little frightening, when you're trying to run a happy hotel. Sometimes I wish he'd go back to wherever he came from. Well, Fred said, he's bound to leave one of these days. Maybe, Mr. Mason said doubtfully. Offhand, though, I'd say the way he's taken it in, he can't afford to. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. People Soup by Alan Arkin Originally published in Galaxy Magazine November 1958 Narrated by Tom Trisser Bonnie came home from school and found her brother in the kitchen doing something important at the sink. She knew it was important 
because he was making a mess and talking to himself. The sink drain was loaded down with open soda bottles, a sack of flour, cornmeal, dog biscuits, molasses, bromo seltzer, a tin of sardines and a box of soap chips. The floor was covered with drippings and every cupboard in the kitchen was open. At the moment, Bonnie's brother was putting all his energy into shaking a plastic juicer that was half filled with an ominous-looking frothy mixture. Bonnie waited for a moment, keeping well out of range, and then said, "'Hi, Bob.' "'Lo,' no, he answered, without looking up. "'Where's Mum? Shopping?' Bonnie inched a little closer. "'What are you doing, Bob?' she asked. "'Nothing.' "'Can I watch?' No. Bonnie took this as a cue to advance two cautious steps. She knew from experience how close she could approach her brother when he was being creative, and still maintain a peaceful neutrality. Bob slopped a cupful of ketchup into the juicer, added a can of powdered mustard, a drop of milk, six aspirin, and a piece of chewing gum, being careful to spill a part of each package used. Bonnie moved in a bit closer. "'Are you making another experiment?' she asked. "'Who wants to know?' Bob answered in his mad scientist voice, as he swaggered over to the refrigerator and took out an egg, some old bacon fat, a capsuled vitamin pin, yesterday's jello, and a bottle of clam juice. "'Me wants to know,' said Bonnie, picking up an apple that had rolled out of the refrigerator and fallen on the floor. "'Why should I tell you?' "'I have a quarter. Where'd you get it?' "'Mum gave it to me. "'If you give it to me, I'll tell you what I'm doing. "'It's not worth it. "'I'll let you be my assistant, too. "'Still not worth it. "'For ten cents? "'Okay, ten cents.' "'She counted out the money to her brother "'and put on an apron. "'What should I do now, Bob?' "'Get the salt,' Bob instructed. "'He poured sardine oil from the can into the juicer, "'being very careful not to let the sardines fall in.' When he had squeezed the last drop of oil out of the can, he ate all the sardines and tossed the can into the sink. Bonnie went after the salt, and when she lifted out the box, she found a package containing two chocolate graham crackers. "'Mum has a new hiding place, Bob,' she announced. Bob looked up. "'Where is it?' "'Behind the salt.' "'What did you find there?' Two chocolate grahams.' Bobby held out his hand, accepted one of the crackers without thanks, and proceeded to crumble the whole thing into his concoction, not even stopping to lick the chocolate off his hands. Bonnie frowned in disbelief. She had never seen such self-sacrifice. The act made her aware, for the first time, of the immense significance of the experiment. She dropped her quarrel completely and walked over to the sink to get a good look at what was being done. All she saw in the sink was a wadded wet cornflake box, the empty sardine tin and spillings from the juicer, which by this time was beginning to take on a distinctive and unpleasant odour. Bob gave Bonnie the job of adding seven pinches of salt and some cocoa to the concoction. "'What's it going to be, Bob?' she asked, blending the cocoa on her hands into a yellow corduroy skirt. "'Stuff,' Bob answered, unbending a little. "'Government stuff?' "'Nope.' "'Spaceship stuff?' "'Nope.' "'Medicine?' "'Nope.' "'I give up. "'It's animal serum,' Bob said, "'sliced his thumb on the sardine can, "'glanced unemotionally at the cut, ignored it. "'What's animal serum, Bob?' "'It's certain properties without which the universe "'in eternity regards for human beings.' "'Oh,' Bonnie said. "'She took off her apron and sat down at the other end of the kitchen.' The smell from the juicer was beginning to reach her stomach. Bobby combed the kitchen for something else to throw into his concoction and came up with some oregano and liquid garlic. "'I guess this is about it,' he said. He poured the garlic and the oregano into his juicer, put the lid on, shook it furiously for a minute, and then emptied the contents into a deep pot. "'What are you doing now, Bob?' Bonnie asked. "'You have to cook it for seven minutes.' Bobby lit the stove, put a cover on the pot, set the timer for ten minutes, and left the room. Bonnie tagged after him, and the two of them got involved in a rough game of basketball in the living room. Bing! said the timer. 
Bob dropped the basketball on Bonnie's head and ran back into the kitchen. It's all done, he said, and took the cover off the pot. Only his dedication to his work kept him from showing the discomfort he felt with the smell that the pot gave forth. Phew, said Bonnie. What do we do it with now? Throw it out? No, stupid. We have to stir it till it cools and then drink it. Drink it? Bonnie wrinkled her nose. How come we have to drink it? Bobby said. Because that's what you do with experiments, stupid. But, Bob, it smells like garbage. Medicine smells worse, and it makes you healthy, Bob said, while stirring the pot with an old wooden spoon. Bonnie held her nose, stood on tiptoe, and looked in at the cooking solution. Will this make us healthy? Maybe, Bob kept stirring. What will it do? You'll see. Bob took two clean dish towels, draped them around the pot, and carried it over to the formica kitchen table. In the process, he managed to dip both towels in the mixture and burn his already sliced thumb. One plastic handle of the pot was still smouldering from being too near the fire, but none of these things seemed to have the slightest effect on him. He put the pot down in the middle of the table and stared at it, chin in hand. Bonnie plopped down opposite him, put her chin in her hands, and asked, "'We have to drink that stuff?' "'Yep. "'Who has to drink it first? Bob made no sign of having heard. "'I thought so,' said Bonnie. Still no comment. "'What if it kills me?' Bobby spoke by raising his whole head and keeping his jaw stationary in his hands. "'How can it hurt you? There's nothing but pure food in there.' Bonnie also sat and stared. "'How much of that stuff do I have to drink?' "'Just a little bit. Stick one finger in and lick it off.' Bonnie pointed a cautious finger at the tarry-looking brew and slowly immersed it until it barely covered the nail. "'Is that enough?' "'Plenty,' said Bob in a judicious tone. Bonnie took a finger out of the pot and stared at it for a moment. "'What if I get sick?' You can't get sick. There's aspirin and vitamins in it, too. Bonnie sighed and wrinkled her nose. Well, here goes, she said. She licked off a little bit. Bob watched her with his television version of a scientific look. How do you feel? he inquired. Bonnie answered, It's not so bad once it goes down. You can taste the chocolate crayon cracker. Bonnie was really enjoying the attention. Hey, she said, I'm starting to get a funny feeling in my... And, before she could finish the sentence, there was a loud pop. Bob's face registered extreme disappointment. She sat quite still for a moment and then said, What happened? You've turned into a chicken. The little bird lifted its wings and looked down at itself. How come I'm a chicken, Bob? it said, cocking its head to one side and staring at him with its left eye. "'Ah, nuts,' he explained. "'I expected you to be more of a pigeon thing.' Bob mulled over the ingredients of his stew to see what went wrong. The chicken hopped around on the chair on one leg, flapped its wings experimentally, and found itself on the kitchen table. It walked to the far corner and peered into a small mirror that hung on the side of the sink cabinet. "'I'm a pretty ugly chicken boy,' it said. It inspected itself with its other eye, and, finding no improvement, walked back to Bobby. "'I don't like to be a chicken, Bob,' it said. "'Why not? What does it feel like?' "'It feels skinny, and I can't see so good.' "'How else does it feel?' "'That's all how it feels. Make me stop being it. First, tell me better what it's like. "'I told you already. Make me stop being it. "'What are you afraid of?' Why don't you see what it's like first, before you change back? This is a valuable experience. The chicken tried to put its hands on its hips, but could find neither hips nor hands. You better change me back, boy, it said, and gave Bob the left eye glare. Will you stop being stupid and just see what it's like first? Bob was finding it difficult to understand her lack of curiosity. Wait till Mum sees what an ugly mess I am, boy. Will you ever get it? Bonnie was trying very hard to see Bob with both eyes at once, which was impossible. "'You're a sissy, Bonnie. You ruined the opportunity of a lifetime. I'm disgusted with you.' Bob dipped his forefinger in the serum and held it toward the chicken. 
It pecked what it could from the finger, and tilted its head back. In an instant the chicken was gone, and Bonnie was back. She climbed down from the table, wiped her eyes, and said, "'It's a good thing you've fixed me, boy. Would you ever have got it?' "'Ah, you're nothing but a sissy,' Bob said, and licked off a whole fingerful of his formula. "'If I change into a horse, I won't let you ride me, and if I change into a leopard, I'll bite your head off.' Once again the loud pop was heard. Bonnie stood up, wide-eyed. "'Oh, Bob!' she said. "'You're beautiful!' "'What am I?' Bob asked. "'You're a beautiful St. Bernard, Bob. Let's go show Melissa and Chuck.' "'A St. Bernard?' The animal looked disgusted. "'I don't want to be no dog. I want to be a leopard. But you're beautiful, Bob. Go look in the mirror.' "'Nah!' The dog paddled over to the table. "'What are you going to do, Bob?' "'I'm going to try it again.' The dog put its front paws on the table, knocked over the serum, and lapped up summer as it dripped on the floor. Pop went the serum, taking effect. Bobby remained on all fours and kept on lapping. Pop went the serum again. "'What am I now?' he asked. "'You're still a St. Bernard,' said Bonnie. "'The devil with it, then,' said the dog. "'Let's forget all about it.' The dog took one last lap of serum. Pop! Bobby got up from the floor and dejectedly startled out of the back of the door. Bonnie skipped after him. "'What'll we do now, Bob?' she asked. "'We'll go down to Thrifty's and get some ice cream.' They walked down the hill silently, Bobby brooding over not having been a leopard, and Bonnie wishing he had stayed at St. Bernard. As they approached the main street of the small town, Bonnie turned to her brother. "'You want to make some more of that stuff tomorrow?' "'Not the same stuff,' said Bob. "'What'll we make instead?' "'I ain't decided yet. "'You want to make an atomic bomb?' "'Maybe. "'Can we do it in the juicer?' "'Sure,' Bob said. "'And we'll have to get a couple of onions.'" The End Subscribe for your daily stories of future's past. A new story every single day.